Hello and welcome everyone to the Chesapeake Environmental Improvement Council's 37th annual award ceremony. We're so excited to have all of you here. This is an awesome big crowd this year. For those of you who don't know, the mission of the CEIC, we call it the CEIC around here, is to promote litter prevention, recycling, and beautification by encouraging residents at the grassroots level to get involved to help keep our city clean and green. Now, 18 volunteers are appointed by the mayor to serve on the governing board. However, thousands of people throughout our community are participating in hundreds of events all throughout the year. So a lot of hands go into what this, this program does. Um, I would like to introduce the fine people to my right and my left. First, of course, starting off with the honorable Rick West, mayor of the city of Chesapeake. You gotta clap for the mayor. <laughs> Next to him is Mr. Eric Gunderson. He is the certified horticulturist and native plant expert with Southern Branch Nursery. And then, of course, another plant expert, Mr. Watson Lawrence, Director of Agriculture for the city. Mr. Wayne Martin, Director of Student Services with Chesapeake Public Schools. The Honorable Frank King, Commissioner of Revenue. Reverend Wayne Jones, he is an appointed member of the CEIC. Now over to my left is Alden Cleanthus. She is chairperson for the CEIC. Keith chose to sit a little bit farther away from Alden, so he is uh, the director of public communications, Heath Covey. <laughs> Mike Barber, director of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism. And Mr. David Sackett, who is another appointed member of the CEIC. Now at this time, we'd like to do the presentation of colors by the Chesapeake Police Department Honor Guard, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Ms. Raven Love, Miss Abilities, Chesapeake 2018, and Mr. Ryan Ball, Mr. Abilities, Chesapeake 2018. Come on up, guys. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, the, to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. and Miss Ability 2018. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bet you didn't know you'd have royalty here. All right. Y'all can sit. Next, we would like to do the invocation with Reverend Wayne Jones. Reverend? Good afternoon. In the second chapter of Genesis, I believe the 15th verse, you will find that God took the man and the woman, placed them in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Let us pray. O oh, holy and all-wise God, we thank you for this appointed hour. We come before you now to bless all those who have put their hands to the plow, who have decided to keep this city. We ask, Lord God, that you bless their hearts. Bless and continue to encourage each and every honoree, each and every willing worker, each and every volunteer. We thank you, Lord God, that we live in the city of Chesapeake. 
We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have appointed over us the mayor, the administration, the staff, the workers, even those who participate on work crews. Bless each and every one who does their part to make this the most beautiful of the seven cities. And now, Lord God, we thank those who have prepared food for our sustenance. We know, Lord God, that all things come from thee, and we bless you. We thank you for the food we are about to receive as nourishment to our bodies. This is our prayer. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. Before we jump into our, the, the big events, um, I want to recognize some of our council members who are here today. I'm sorry, I know you guys have your mouths full. <laughs> Mr. Stephen Best, Mr. Matt Hamill, Ms. Debbie Ritter, and of course, Dr. Eller Ward up here. Did I forget anybody? Of course, the mayor. Shout out. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, shout out to all the staff members, too. Wave your hand if you're a city staff member. I see a lot of you here. I see you, Public Works. All right. Hi. Thank you all for being here. It's great to have everyone. So, woo, I'm on now. Um, next up, I want to introduce Alden Cleanthus. We, we spoke a little bit about her, met her real quick before. Now I want to introduce her to you. She has deep roots here in Chesapeake, having spent nearly her entire life in Hampton Roads. One of her favorite places in the world is our very own Great Dismal Swamp. She attended Old Dominion University, where she received a bachelor's degree in environmental sciences. She actively serves on multiple committees for the city of Chesapeake, including the Stormwater Committee, the CEIC, and the Sustainability Committee. And this is her third year as chair for the CEIC. Now, Alden currently co-owns Epic Made, a graphic design and marketing company, with her husband of 12 years. Is that still right? Carl. Um, she also works as a part-time consultant for various businesses, advocating for smart growth, sustainability, and environmental health. Alden finds her peace and quiet time in urban farming, growing a lot of her family's organic vegetables. I'm coming over for dinner. Um, her husband says she doesn't feel normal unless she has her hands in the dirt. But of course, most importantly of all, Alden is the mom to a wonderful little boy. So Alden, come on up here. Thank you so much for that introduction and welcome to the 37th Annual Environmental Improvement Awards Luncheon. I am honored and privileged to serve on this committee with my fellow Chesapeake residents and I have been even more honored to serve as their chair for the past three years. The Chesapeake Environmental Improvement Council is an all-volunteer committee made up of more than two dozen full-time members and associate members. The CEIC is made up of some of the most diverse and well-informed citizens that I've ever met. We are comprised of arborists, master gardeners, environmental advocates, enthusiastic recyclers, parks and recreation specialists, and even hobby farmers like myself. Every meeting is truly a treasure trove of information, and if you've never attended one of our monthly meetings, please do. If I could ask for a moment that the current members of the CEIC stand and be recognized and remain standing for a moment while I brag about you. Our members and coordinated volunteers reached in events with participation in booth visits 13,270 people in the last year. The total reach of information through those events, volunteering and social media engagement was over 37,000 people. Our total volunteer hours across all environmental programs for the last year was 4,398. Trash and recycling collected at Chesapeake Recycle Day events with the coordination of CEIC was 80,000 pounds last year. And we also planted over 3,000 trees. So thank you for all that you do. We appreciate you. Uh, 
Uh, thanks to our bylaws and term limits, this is the last time I will stand up here as your chair. So I want to take a minute to say that it has truly been an honor to serve with you all. I can't thank you enough for the trust you've put in me, the help, the inspiration, and the guidance. Thank you for all that each and every one of you do for our city. We do a lot to beautify this city and grow the recycling efforts of our entire community. And we are also doing a lot to help the general state of the environment. Our notable yards contest now includes criteria for stormwater management, native plants, and environmentally friendly practices. We have now expanded those same expectations to our business beautification awards. Each subsequent year sees growth in the participation of our recycling events. This past year, we doubled the amount of trash that we recycled from the year before. In 2018, we ran an incredibly successful calendar photo contest where we challenged the citizens of Chesapeake to take their favorite photos of Chesapeake and enter them into a competition for real money. And we took the best photos and comprised a calendar that's available by donation out at our desk. There are some really beautiful places in Chesapeake that are included in there, and so are all of our events, so you can get more involved. And as seen by the massive growth in entries of our clean and green poster contest, our children are paying attention. At last glance, we had 1,200 Chesapeake students register to participate in the 2019 Clean and Green Poster Contest. We must continue to be good stewards of the planet and our community for the sake of our children and grandchildren, and we must continue to be the change we want to see in the world because our children are watching. I'd like to take a moment and give a special thank you to Megan Hale. Where are you at, Megan? She is our new city staff liaison and our tireless supporter. I want to welcome you to the team and thank you for making all of this possible in the last year and for pretending that I'm not a hot mess when we both know that I really am. I also want to thank Mayor West. Your support, interest, and commitment to our work is deeply appreciated. And with that said, I hope you all enjoy your time here today and thank you for your support. Thank you, Alden. Very impressive stuff, CEIC. Man, when you hear it all added up like that, it's awesome. Okay, next up, I would like to introduce the Honorable Rick West. He was elected to city council in May of 2008, re-elected in 2012 and 2016. He assumed the office of mayor in November of 2017 and was officially elected to mayor in May of 2018. He is a lifelong resident of Chesapeake Mayor West is a retired educator of the Chesapeake Public School System and a former middle school principal. Did anybody in here have him as principal? No, any former students? Okay, now I'm sure you find him everywhere. So, <laughs> uh, Dr. West earned his bachelor's degree in social studies from Old Dominion University, a master's degree in education from the University of Virginia, and a doctorate in leadership from Virginia Tech. Mayor West. Thank you, thank you. I was really worried that one of you guys were going to raise your hand when she asked. Were you? Yeah, I know you thought about it, didn't you? Yeah, just to make me feel a little older. Thank you very much. You know, when I looked at my calendar this week and I found um, that I had a student leadership event yesterday and this event today, it really made me excited about, once again, as I almost every day, uh, being mayor of this great city. If Steve Best is correct in the research that he did, I am the seventh mayor to get before you and uh, welcome you to this event. And it certainly is my honor. You know, I want to thank um, Ryan and uh, Raven for your leading the Pledge of Allegiance. Certainly, uh, Reverend Jones for your beautiful prayer and Alden for all the wonderful things that you've done and the leadership that you have uh, shown in this organization. You really have been a pleasure. You kind of renew my interest and my spirit in what I know is the right thing to do is keeping our city clean. And it goes all the way back to uh, Mayor Marion Whitehurst who created a committee about uh, keeping litter, uh, keeping clean, keeping our city clean. And of course then uh, Mayor uh, Sid Oman formed the committee, as you said, in 1983, and ever since then, we've had support from our city council, and it's been a, it's been a wonderful marriage. It was 
also a good experience for me as middle school principal to watch our kids get involved in the poster contest and so forth. So you all have a great history. One of the things that you talked about all then when you were talking about the diversity of this, um, this group, uh, uh, the CEIC, the, commit, the meeting that I went to, not only did I get a lot of good information, the one thing they all have in common is they are very nice people, <laughs> just generally nice people that are concerned about their community and about their, um, about their city. <clears throat> Recycling is one of the, one of the uh, missions of this organization. I met with an organization this morning that is going to be asking our city council for permission to build a $200 million plant to recycle a, a lot of good stuff and to create some, uh, to create wax and, and diesel uh, fuel from uh, commercial garbage. 97% of organic materials will be able, if what they say is accurate. There are 15 people from our city staff, from the communities that are going down to Durham to look at a simulated plant. And if that is true, you know, this organization will be, their, your job will be easier. And I look forward to hearing uh, your input on that. <clears throat> Again, I really do feel honored to be mayor of this city because of organizations like this. And I do believe that God really does honor, honor our city and show favors. I think when we have problems that come up, like the recycling uh, problems that TCIP, TCI, whatever, are, are experiencing, there's always an answer that comes. And it's an answer that I can't explain in human terms, but there are always answers that just seem to meet our city's needs. And I thank you all for your prayers. We thank you for your support. Thank you for being here. And congratulations to all those who will be serving, uh, getting uh, recognized today. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor West. <clears throat> so now we move on to our speaker, Mr. Eric Gunderson. Eric is the owner of Southern Branch Nursery, which celebrates its 38th year here in Chesapeake. Very impressive. Mr. Gunderson is well known in the area as a native plant expert and holds certifications in landscape de design, Virginia horticulture, wildlife habitat design, and he's on the Chesapeake Bay landscape professional. He is a Chesapeake Bay landscape professional. He has served on the board of the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council and is a member of the Virginia Native Plant Marketing Partnership. He is the recipient of the 2016 Virginia Nursery and Landscape Association's Environmental Steward of the Year Award. I had to take a breath to say that one. Eric is a graduate of Virginia Tech with a Bachelor of Science in Horticulture. Eric, come on up. Uh, I'd like to thank the Chesapeake Environmental Improvement Council for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm getting over a little illness, so bear with me if my voice comes and goes. I, I'll repeat as little, hopefully, as I have to. Uh, what I'd like to do is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is show you um, my picture and, and verbiage of what I'm passionate about, what we do for a living at, at my business, but um, also why native plants are so vital and important to the natural environment and why we, it should matter to us. Um, I'll show pictures of initially of indigenous plants that grow in the wild right here in Southeast Virginia and, and specifically Chesapeake that aren't in the stores for sale just yet or in the natural environment, but they're landscape worthy. Um, there's, there's more than you might think. I know I, my, my nursery brethren aren't getting the plants out there is, is that's, that's my job, but I, I'm also going to show pictures of the interaction of the native plants with why it's important for, to landscape with them and have them in, the, in our neighborhoods and, and uh, businesses in, in the landscape and, and businesses. Uh, also, I'll show pictures of conservation landscaping using native plants and why, why that's so important. Okay, so let's see. Um, uh, if I can, I'd like to read a few notes because I have a lot I did want to say, and then I'll get to the pictures and show you uh, of what I brought today uh, and why the benefits of landscaping with native plants far outweigh using what I call out-of-town plants. Those would be ones from uh, Asia or Europe or not into the coastal plain or eastern, eastern U.S. 
Uh, native plants are visually beautiful. They are attractive year-round with a change in the seasons from unique flowers to vibrant fall colors, leaves and stems, fruit shapes and colors. Bark textures are all reasons to incorporate indigenous plants in the home or work landscape. Southeast Virginia native plants show a sense of place. Sassafras, our Chesapeake ball cypress, live oaks, southern magnolias, all let you know you're on the coastal plain of Virginia. There are local native species unique to Southeast Virginia that aren't located in any other part of the state. A few to mention, and some of these aren't in the trade, but they, they should be. Cirilla racemiflora, the tai tai or leatherwood, Stuartia malacandendron, silky camellia, Clematis crispa, many common names, marsh clematis, blue jasmine, curly clematis, to name a few. I'll show some of these, but there's many out there that I'm doing the best I can to get those propagated in the trade, and I'll, I'll go over that as I show pictures. Local native plants are essential to a healthy watershed. They provide oxygen and habitat for fresh and saltwater ecosystems. Plant roots absorb nutrients and prevent sediment from entering our local waterways, reducing pollution and improving water quality. Local plants are adapted to local temperatures and our local rainfall fluctuations. Once established, they require less watering, no fertilizing, no pesticides or insecticides to keep them going. A benefit in saving time, money, and precious resources. Spraying pesticides for insects and diseases is not necessary as local insects that feed on the local plants rarely eat enough to harm the plant as they need to physically come back and eat, and eat again at another time. Mulching your flower beds with hardwood mulch leaves will feed your plants naturally as, and help build a healthy soil that will feed your plant roots and hold rainwater in place, recharging our local aquifers. <clears throat> local native plants support wildlife better than non-native plants. Only native plants can be hosts for all the indigenous insects. This is vital for the continued existence of all the birds, mammals, and invertebrates in the area. Uh, some insects are generalists, but most are host-specific, meaning that the insects only have one or two species that they can reproduce on to continue their existence. Uh, everyone knows about uh, monarch butterflies. That's a good example. Uh, they reproduce on Asclepias species, milkweeds. If the milkweed plant isn't in the area, they go locally extinct. Monarchs happen to be a migratory insect. Uh, most insects live out their whole existence within one or two miles of where they originated. Uh, if their host plants that they reproduce on aren't present, they won't be present either. Measurable medical benefits of native plants have been documented in a book by Dr. Richard Louvre. Reduced heart rate, blood pressure, and general well-being uh, has been improved while spending time in nature. The next time you plant or replace an out-of-town plant, consider natives to replace the plant. Please don't plant an invasive. Just because a Bradford pear or Ligustrum is not a nuisance in your yard doesn't mean it won't be invasive somewhere else. The bird that eats the fruit from one of these trees flies to a local water waterway and drops a seed where it gets going, displacing valuable local species. A local autopsy was done, I believe, last year. It made the paper in the VPLS. Uh, migratory cedar waxwings eating Nandina berries. Uh, autopsy was done that the berries change their chemistry uh, as the fruit matures, and at the wrong time, it's talked to the local um, cardinals as well as migratory songbirds like the waxwing. So next time you need to replace a dying shrub or replace your Nandina berries, consider a native plant. Um, most birds can only feed their young caterpillars, so if the plants that the caterpillars eat to reproduce on aren't there, then the birds won't be there either. Uh, birds need close to hundreds of caterpillars to feed just one clutch of birds, so that's pretty significant. If the general public demands more local native plants, the supply will be greater and more species will become available to the home gardener and businesses. Seeing butterflies, dragonflies, birds, or bees, or lightning bugs around your plants is much more exciting than seeing nothing at all. <clears throat> nothing is what non-natives do for the environment. They are basically a statue or ornament just taking up space. If they are invasive alien, that just increases the diversity, excuse me, the destruction of local biodiversity. Uh, just to give you a little connection with why our town plants don't work, their chemistry isn't right. The in plants and, and animals in this country didn't grow up together over the millennia, so that's why they can't use plants from, from out of country. 
when you take an invasive plant out, have a plan to replace it with a native. Native plants conserve energy and water. Deciduous trees create cooler and more stable environment. They produce oxygen and filter the air that we breathe. The backbone for water conservation is in using local native plants. We need to install cisterns, rain barrels, turf stone, permeable pavement where we can. Green roofs, rain gardens, bioswales, retention ponds, layered native vegetation, riparian buffers, bogs, living shorelines, all with native plants help keep the water on, uh, excuse me, keep the rainwater on the tax map parcel. Installing native plants in lawn areas which aren't needed for play will reduce the need for fossil fuel, fertilizers, and herbicides, and fuel for mowing as well as costly irrigation. No fertilizing is required for native plants if you maintain a leaf mulch bed. The plants will be fed just like the plants in the forest, building up the soil through leaf litter, mulching, and organic decay. This should be what you want in your flower bed. Soil microbes will build up to sustain the feeding of your plants. Native plants used in the home planting beds will help wildlife survive the urban environment. Animals need shelter from the weather and predators, as well as places to rear their young. Insects, birds, and mammals aren't notified when a virgin property is built upon or disturbed. If people garden with native plants, it may be helpful, may be, <clears throat> excuse me. If people garden with native plants, it may help displaced animals with food and shelter until they can find a natural area. Provide wildlife food by gardening with native plants. Keep a brush pile, have a ground level water reservoir for drinking, have a small rock outcropping for invertebrates. So I'm hoping I can make this work. I'd like to show pictures of uh, some of the indigenous plants as well as their interaction with, uh, with, with other living things in our natural environment, caterpillars and their host plants. And then I'll segue into uh, conservation landscaping issues with, with native plants. This is Clematis crispa, I'm sorry, that I mentioned earlier as being one of our natives that grows wild around here. Just amazing. It blooms for about four months out of the year, I've observed. This is going to be a new one for us. Uh, I should have this late summer. Um, sonar shade, it just likes it moist, as many areas, not just in wintertime, but in summer too, are moist in Chesapeake. This is a, 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 a no-brainer. Bignonia. Uh, Capriolata, this is a uh, cross vine, another native vine that's great for pollinators as well as a host plant for many insects. Uh, this is one of our deciduous rhododendrons that grows in, in the area. Uh, it doesn't grow most other places in the state. Rhododendron paracliminoides, Pinksterbloom azalea. This as well as a rhododendron atlanticum, the coast azalea, which is more fragrant and, and all white, uh, grows wild out where we are, but in different pockets. You don't see them everywhere, but you'll see them in local uh, areas uh, where, where they like where they are. Uh, Clitoria mariana, butterfly pea, as a moth on that one. Uh, gorgeous pale violet, the lavender flowers, blooms for a long time. This likes it somewhat well-drained and, and at least half a day of sun. Vernonia nova boracensis, long bloom period late in the summer. Great pollinator plant, but it's visually beautiful people. You spend a few minutes around this plant and you, you feel better. Uh, this is uh, Cephalanthus occidentalis button bush. Uh, this grows na natively around here, but you don't see it too much in home gardens, and that's a, that's a shame. The flowers that you see there uh, look like a golf ball on steroids with spikes on it, and it obviously uh, attracts the local inhabitants. Uh, turtle head and coastal joe pie weed together here. Uh, great plants, underused in the landscape. These are available at, at most nurseries in the trade. Uh, they're underused as well. Uh, this, this one is uh, fast becoming one of my favorite plants. This you'll see at some of the parks in Chesapeake. This is uh, Cirilla raceiflora, tai tai. Uh, green leaves most all the year. It has white flowers in the summer. Uh, about the time it starts getting cool, October, as early as mid-October, it starts having yellow, peach, orange, pink fall colors. Uh, the leaves hang on. If it's sheltered and doesn't, isn't in the wind, it's almost evergreen. I've only seen a few that ho don't hold the leaves for maybe one or two months. But anyway, the, the, after the flowers where it has a seed fruit that drops, uh, it hangs on for quite a, quite a long time. It's very visually attractive, nice browns. Uh, this, this guy here, this is a larva of a giant swallowtail butterfly. 
It's, it's big because the butterfly is big. This is a larva feeding on its host plant, Xanthocyllin club of Hercules, a toothache or, or toothache tree or Hercules club. This is the butterfly itself. These are uh, the, the Xanthocyllin club of Hercules, uh, toothache tree, and the giant swallowtail butterfly are both I've seen in, in Pungo area, Virginia Beach, the uh, stands of that tree there. I'm sure we have it in southern Chesapeake too, just haven't seen it myself in the wild. I've sold this plant to a number of um, Virginia native butterfly society people and they've, that last year they have had larva from my plants and these two pictures that I'm showing, this adult and the other came from, uh, from, from, from the plants I sold. This is a, a mature toothache tree that they would lay their eggs on. So if this isn't here, they also reproduce on uh, hop trees, same teleptera that um, beer is, is made from. So, but if, if those trees aren't there, then they're not there. I'm, I have some planted, but I haven't seen them at my place yet. But that's a big deal. They're very attractive, and when they're gone, they're gone. Uh, this is a, a southern red oak in central Chesapeake with all the uh, oak caterpillars on it. They're having a party there, doing great. The leaves have leafed out. There's a new flush of growth coming. Uh, great for, cat for, for the birds to feed their young, but there's always enough to go around, so they reproduce into the moths that they're going to be. This is an I.O. moth. Um, gorgeous. The moth... The adult of this larva is, is nothing spectacular, but the caterpillar itself is, is, is pretty remarkable. It, it looks better than that in person. This is on a Baptisia australis, um, the purple falls, uh, the, um, I've, I've forgotten, uh, blue, uh, Amy, what's the, what, blue false indigo, thank you. That's the host plant for, for this guy and, and for others. So uh, Euthamia, graminifolia, slender leaf goldenrod. Goldenrods are quite common in, in Chesapeake. There's lightning bugs on this. It's up high. They blend in pretty well because they're black and yellow. Uh, but this hosts a lot of, a lot of insects. Uh, you'll see this in the fall. They're a fall-blooming plant. Uh, just amazing. They're short. They can take it dry as well as our moisture here in Chesapeake. Uh, another host plant. Uh, this moth I took a picture of at our place in che central Chesapeake. It looked like um, leather carving or wood carving. It was almost fake. Uh, this, I, I mentioned a lot of the moths aren't that attractive as adults. This one's just amazing. I don't know what it looks like. I haven't been able to identify it, but I, I do think it's common. Most moths hang out in the trees. Uh, they're, they're, they're not uh, perennials uh, that host them. Uh, this is a purple false foxglove, Agalinus purpurea is a plant. It's an annual, actually, but uh, it hangs around long enough in the fall for a ton of things to interact with it. This is a buckeye butterfly larva here, and I, uh, so anyway, that's, that's a very uh, valuable one as well. This is a leopard moth in our fern buckets in the nursery. Uh, it's about the size of a hot dog. It curls up when you agitate it, or I didn't, but I, I was handling it to get it to show itself to me. It has white, uh, red stripes on its uh, segments, and um, it burrows da down when it's agitated, evidently, because I've read a little about it. The adult is, is very attractive, too. I was hoping to cage it and let it uh, pupate so we could see what the adult looked like when it came out, but it didn't happen. They, evidently, most moths, they burrow down into the... Uh, ground soil layer uh, at night and then come out and and so I, we've not seen it since but I'm hoping they'll they'll have some that come back again this year. Uh, spice bush swallowtail larva look like little snakeheads very cute this is on sassafras they have a few uh, host plants that reproduce them uh, but the point is you don't get this uh, genetic diversity without having the plants. Uh, I'd like to segue into uh, conservation landscape needs and uses, uh, conserving water, conserving energy and such with the native plants. Uh, this is a rain garden in Virginia Beach, a lot of, bio, a lot of different plants. Uh, that in the home garden, you can help by doing that as well. This is another rain garden installed in Suffolk, holds the water, lets it filter and purify and drops into the local aquifer without taking silts and fines, sediments, fertilizers off just the lawn right into the waterway. This backs up into the Nevins River. Another rain garden is in Virginia Beach. Uh, this is in Virginia Beach. It's a, 
a lake drinking reservoir for the city of Virginia Beach uh, office building that the uh, ownership wanted us to take out a lawn and put in a meadow so they don't have to mow it, but they're having geese issues. So what we did was uh, do just that. We planted plugs of grasses and wildflower perennials and uh, over a season or so, it's grown up. We planted Andropogon glomeratus, which is a tall native grass. Uh, it, there is maintenance on all meadows. This only has to be mowed now once a year, but you're saving all that energy. The labor energy that was done weekly or every couple weeks for mowing isn't there on that humongous strip anymore. Uh, you do have some up close, but it, it has helped retard the geese uh, pooping on the sidewalks and lawn at the building. And there's another shot from the other direction. Um, shorelines, this is uh, probably a, a, a concrete edge that was built in the 1950s. This is in, in Norfolk on the Lizard River watershed. A uh, job I did some time ago. They were losing their lawn from overwash. Uh, the salinity was so high it was killing the Bermuda grass, and that's usually pretty tolerant. Anyway, we, we uh, improved that by using black needle rush and Spartana patens, which are salt tolerant grasses that grow here indigenously. So they still had a lawn, and they didn't want flowers or anything. They wanted it neat and clean. That helped save the soil there. It was dredged when the bulkhead was in from the mud flat and such soils from the river, and so it wasn't, you couldn't grow other kind of plants if you wanted to, so this, this makes so much more sense anyway. Uh, another site in Virginia Beach for same, a uh, homeowner wanted to improve their site for having, um, you know, they, they had a couple acres or more on their property anyway, and so they had this taken out, and I didn't come to the property until after this was done, and they were trying to figure out what to do. So we we, we uh, put down jute mesh so they wouldn't lose any more of their soil t into the waterway when it was uh, draining. This was the Linhaven River watershed. So we planted grasses, perennials, and shrubs and things. This was looking back at the same side. This is a winter shot. Uh, it looks nice then too, but as things matured, um, Lots of things nest in here year round, but they don't have geese on here anymore. The shot looking the other way, and it's visually beautiful most all year. I, mean, I, I enjoy the brown. Some people think that's it's got to be more attractive than the neighbor across the way. If if they don't have geese, they don't have anything. So uh, Norfolk failing bulkhead, um, lots of lawn. Wonder why they keep mowing it, and you know nothing happens, and they're silting into the waterway. So this guy was a was a bird painter and photographer, and he wanted to do something. So we took it out of lawn or planted through. When I say take out, sometimes you can sod cut and remove. Sometimes it makes sense just to plant right through the soil. But I don't want to get off on a tangent for technical details. Uh, these wildflower perennials, grasses, and we do have shrubs and trees in here. Uh, the picture's not great from this color, but you can see uh, Kostoletskia, seashore mallow, uh, red lobelia, cardinalis, uh, just some ponadaria, the pickleweed there, and some uh, switch grasses. Uh, I think it's much more exciting to see than, than that. So I don't have a couple more, bear with me. This is the funnest thing we get to do, or one, one of them, when we're improving properties is taking the lawn away that's a side shot. That's the front yard. 100% no grass because she's a single woman that's living there now. They don't, don't have kids to play with, so no big deal. Um, and turn it into a butterfly meadow. There's maintenance with everything, but this is a lot more fun than cutting grass. It doesn't cost any, any money. A friend of mine in Norfolk, trees had to be taken down because they were damaged in a storm. Didn't want to put grass back in, so we put a meadow, a little... little um, a low, low growing uh, um, Aragrossus spectabilis, purple love grass, as the dominant lawn gra or dominant grass in the meadow, and then all the wildflowers blooming. Uh, it's been in a year or so now, it, and they love it, looks great. Another way is to do conservation landscaping. This is uh, obviously um, floating islands with plants that can take oxygen from the atmosphere as well as the water. We're filtering nitrates and different things that people feel they need to fertilize their yard 20 times a year and it washes in and at least this is a help. So you have clean water. This is in Norfolk. Dead trees be just as valuable or so as, as live trees. Woodpeckers, 
I think I got one. Yeah, this is a, a resident black snake on the, on the, our farm. This is a, a dead sweet gum that's about 30 feet tall. It went down last year, but it was up for quite a few years. I just let it go because it was valuable. Um, when it falls down, then the box turtles eat all the insects after the birds are done with what deteriorates the plant. So they're valuable. Don't cut them down until something's dead. It's, it has value. This is uh, waste management in Chesapeake. They have overflow BMP or practice, as it were. They have a wet, a wet runoff from their parking lot that's back behind us, looking out to the road there. I don't think you can see their moniker. And uh, they wanted to set an example by not continuing to cut grass because it costs them time and money. And uh, so they put it in a, a wildflower meadow. We have grasses of mixed kinds in there. And, and wildflowers, and they love it. They cut it once a year. They just, just did it for the first time. It's a little over a year old now, and um, it, it's a showpiece for them. It's a lot more pleasing than just grass when they drive in. So uh, that's all the pics I have. I know I probably extended my time, so uh, come to the nursery and visit if you want more conversation. I hope that was bearable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. That was very informative. Um, I, I feel like it was just a few years ago that I learned there were different kinds of grass. So that, I mean, <laughs> consult your experts, right? They, they know more. Um, now for our award ceremony. Um, you'll see those awards over there. Quick FYI about these actual physical awards. They're made of bamboo and recycled glass. Of course, we had to do something like that. So as I call your name, please come forward to accept your awards. Everyone will be able to see photos of the service projects on our screen. And so we'll get started. For the Business Beautification Award, that will be presented by Dr. Ella P. Ward, Chesapeake City Council member. And this award goes to Big Ugly Brewing. Accepting the award will be Jim and Michelle Lantry. The Business Beautification Contest has been held annually since 1994, and judging decisions are based on landscape building, litter control, and signage. Big Ugly Brewing Company relocated to a new and larger facility at 845 South Battlefield Boulevard and greatly improved that property. Chesapeake's first brewery was, has a garage-centric atmosphere due to the owner's love of vintage vehicles. The interior showcases the equipment so guests know that they are in a working brewery, but it was the exterior that grabbed the attention of the judging panel. With the planting of native trees, Eric, they got some native trees in there, and a well-thought-out landscape that includes wood chip mulching and natural fil filtration systems, finishing touches were made on this previously underutilized plot of land. Fire pits and new lighting add to the ambiance of the outdoor patio, making it the perfect place to enjoy a pint really any time of year. So congratulations to you guys. <laughs> Next up, presenting the Government Agency Award will be Mr. Watson Lawrence, the Director of Agriculture, another local expert for all of your plant needs. This award goes to the Chesapeake Central Fleet Management. Accepting the award is David Gochi, Fleet Safety Specialist of Central Fleet. And I see George Reshack going up there too, so shout out to George. <laughs> the Chesapeake Central Fleet Management, a team of 40 city employees, developed and maintained an environmental recycling program to save the city money. Since 2005, they have recovered a, over $175,000 through recycling of scrap metals, waste oils, and automotive tires. Additionally, the fleet has 46 CNG compressed natural gas trucks. 60 hybrid vehicles, and 21 propane vehicles. These alternative fuel efforts earned the group the 2017 Virginia Governor's Green Fleet Award and a sustained distinguished performance designation as a River Star business with the Elizabeth River Project, who we see over there. Hi, guys. The team has offered guidance and support to other organizations and cities on ways to improve their imp environmental impact. Congratulations. Next up is the Adult Community Organization Award. This is being pre presented by Mr. Mike Barber, Director of Parks, Rec, and Tourism. This award goes to the Deep Creek Ruritan Club, and accepting this honor is MJ Kaufman, the Environmental Chair. Now, go ahead. 
Leading by example, members of the Deep Creek Roarton Club have encouraged the community to keep Chesapeake clean and beautiful in a variety of ways. With direction from the group's environmental chair, MJ Kaufman, the organization actively participates in the Chesapeake Adopt a Highway program and has supported Clean the Bay Day for over 20 years, as well as the Parks, Recreation, and Tourism's Paddle for the Border event. As environmentally compliant hood system, oh, an environmentally compliant hood system, um, and gas stove was installed in the clubhouse, and the group devotes 50 hours per month to collecting recyclable materials. The 74 members give over 600 hours to bettering the environment in Chesapeake every year. Way to go, you guys. Now moving on to the Youth Community Organization Award. This is being presented by the Honorable Frank King. And this award goes to Chesapeake Community Programs. Mike Porter is here accepting. The the Chesapeake Division of Community Programs works with youth, youths and adults in the area to give back to the city. They perform numerous tasks that include weeding, pruning, trail maintenance, and graffiti, graffiti removal and cover-up. They're actively involved in the care and maintenance of the Chesapeake Arboretum. In 2018, over 120 youth and adults removed an estimated 800 pounds of litter while working in Chesapeake Parks, like Oak Grove Lake Park and Northwest River Park. Well done. <laughs> Presenting the Community and Communications Award will be, of course, Director of Public Communications, Mr. Heath Covey. And this award goes to Unity Renaissance Ch Church. Accepting the award is Reverend Paul, M I, I knew I was gonna mess this up, McDessey? Reverend McDessey. McDeesey, there it is, third time's the charm. Congratulations. <laughs> Unity Renaissance Church has made enormous improvements to their property in the name of the environment. Volunteers converted the grounds to wildlife habitat by eliminating fertilizers and chemicals, preserving their heirloom and native species, and installing a monarch garden, birdhouses, and feeders. In January of 2018, the church installed 66 solar panels on their roof, reducing air emissions by over 17,000 pounds in just nine months. The congregation practices the three R's by reducing impervious surfaces by sharing a parking lot with an adjacent office, reusing ceramic coffee mugs and harvesting rainwater, and recycling plastic, glass, aluminum, and paper. Well done. Now the Educational Institution Award will be presented by Mr. Wayne Martin from Chesapeake Public Schools. And this award goes to askhrgreen.org. Accepting the award is Rebecca Eastrup, the Environmental Education Planner with the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. And the one and only Jerry Hotnet from Public Utilities. Hi, Jerry. So AskHRGreen.org is the environmental awareness and education program of the 17 local governments in Hampton Roads administered through the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. Utilizing a grant from the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Fund, a group of the region's pro professionals, including Adrian Sawyer with Chesapeake Public Schools, set out to create their second iteration of the Green Learning Guide. The guide, which targets third graders this time, meets standard of learning gui guidelines, by connecting students to their environment and combining educational information with colorful maps, facts, and activities. Concept covered, concepts covered include watershed education, pollution prevention, stormwater management, and water and resource conservation. 23,000 copies have been distributed to every third grader in the region's public schools, and an additional 8,000 copies to private schools and homeschool students. The Green Learning Guide and a Teacher's Resource Guide can be downloaded for free at askhrgreen.org. Well done. So now presenting the new Innovation in Recycling, Reusing, and Repurposing Award will be Mr. Dave Sackett, an appointed member of the CEIC. Now this award goes to Matt Makers, and accepting the award is Phyllis Tarkenton, founder, and you will see over here on the table, all the way in the corner, is an example of these cool mats that I'm gonna tell you about in a sec. Matt Makers' project was started when Phyllis's Bible study teacher taught a group to crochet a sleeping mat out of plastic grocery bags. Mrs. Tarkenton completed the first mat nine years ago and was thrilled to be helping the homeless community by repurposing something that was difficult to recycle. A passion had arisen and a group of eight was formed three years ago. 
The group members cut plastic bags into strips, then ties them together. The strips are rolled into a ball and used to knit the lightweight and easy to clean mats. It takes anywhere between 500 to 900 bags just to make one mat. Phyllis, along with the other ladies in the group, have completed over 900 mats for the Lighthouse Homeless Shelter in Virginia Beach, Union Mission, Homeland Disciples in South Norfolk, and Compassion Advocacy Network, a nonprofit that distributes the mats to the needy. Very cool project. You can see that cool mat over there. Good job, guys. So next up, we are moving to the Business and Industry Award being presented by Alden Cleanthus, our chair, the CEIC chair. This award goes to Colliers International for their work on Greenbrier Market Center, and accepting that award is Julie Alexander, Director of Asset Services. A team, yes, a team with Colliers International helped transition the Greenbrier Market Center to a more environmentally friendly and beautiful shopping center for merchants, patrons, and neighboring patrons. Existing parking lot islands were converted into rain gardens following the city's landscape ordinance, Soil grades were lowered to capture rainfall, native and drought-resistant trees, and vegetation that require less irrigation were planted, and garden beds were redesigned, creating beautiful and safe walking spaces. New architectural features were added to the entrance area along the, with colorful perennial flowers and shrubs, creating clearer sight lines for traffic. Big belly solar compactors and LED parking lot lighting were also installed, reducing the overall carbon footprint of the property. Very cool design. Now we are moving on to the Outstanding Citizen Award. This award, yes, very exciting, right? I heard that. The Outstanding Citizen Award was established in 2008, and it recognizes individuals whose actions improve the environment's well-being um, and the well-being of citizens in Chesapeake. At this time, the Honorable Frank King is very busy today, and he will help us present the Outstanding Award to Mr. Rusty Barath. Rusty, come on up. So Rusty was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, and came to Hampton Roads in 1983 after college with the Navy Submarine Service. He began working for the Chesapeake Commissioner of Revenue in 1992 and now lives in Western Branch. Rusty has been energetically involved in his community for many years. He is the former zone governor for the Holland District Ruritan Club and former president of the South Norfolk Ruritans. Rusty is this year's Ruritan District Governor, where he continues to provide outstanding leadership to many communities. With the Ruritans, he has spearheaded many projects, including, including raising funds for scholarships and Special Olympics, and thanking and honoring public safety officers by serving the meals at Johnson Park and delivering food to those that were on duty. The South Norfolk Ruritans have participated in Paint Your Heart Out for 21 years and take good care of Lakeside Park. A fine example of care came when the group built the Lakeside Veterans Walk, a memorial commemorating those in the armed forces who gave their lives in service for our country from World War I through the Gulf War. He has championed the club in replacing existing lighting in the Chesapeake Care Clinic with state-of-the-art LED indoor and outdoor lighting. Mr. Barath promotes and participates with local environmental groups, including the, in the Elizabeth River Project and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation through Clean the Bay Day. He has served on the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area Board for two years, Congratulations, Rusty, on being Chesapeake's outstanding citizen. Okay, and if it couldn't get more exciting, next up, we have the Pioneer Award. This is our biggest award of the year. One individual chosen to receive the most prestigious award. This individual is recognized for her many years of service to the city of Chesapeake and to the environment. So at this time, Mayor West, if you would help us in presenting this award, the Pioneer Award to Mrs. Amy Weber. <laughs> Amy Weber developed a love of gardening, nature, and teaching at a young age growing up in North Carolina. Her mother was an avid gardener and caregiver, and her father worked for the Soil Conservation Service. Amy moved to this area after high school and settled into her current home in Indian River with her husband, Roger, and their son, Eric. Volunteerism has always been an important component of Amy's life, giving time to the PTA, 
Boy Scouts, marching band, and early childhood education associations. She had a 24-year career as an early childhood teacher where she promoted learning through hands-on experiences, illustrating, obs observing, all while respecting nature, plants, and animals. Amy is now semi-retired, and I love that term. She's like semi-retired, working part-time as a school library book sales rep, allowing her more time to be involved with environmental and community groups. She's a founding member of the Friends of Indian River, where she collaborates on a variety of projects with community members, the city of Chesapeake also, and with the Elizabeth River Project. Amy led the design and installation of the native plant garden at Indian River Park, and ensures volunteers continue to care for it. She has been an active member of Chesapeake Green Drinks since 2013, and an appointed member of the Chesapeake Environmental Inc Improvement Council since 2014, currently serving as secretary, doing very good taking notes, she also became a Chesapeake Master Gardener that year, a longtime goal of hers. Amy has bridged the CEIC and Master Gardeners together to create a much needed recycling information flyer while continuing to work on issues with garden and with water and soil quality, even assisting her church with a rain garden project. Amy volunteers her time with the Chesapeake Humane Society on stormwater remediation and beautification projects. She serves on the South Hampton Roads Master Gardeners Green Thumb Education Series. At committee co -chair, as committee co-chair and continues to uplift her and support her community in so many ways. Amy's husband passed away unexpectedly in the fall of 2015, and it was through the support from family and friends that helped her through this difficult time. Her commitment to work and volunteer efforts kept her going and really filled that void in her life. Most everyone in this room, me included, has had the privilege to know Miss Amy Weber, and it should be no surprise that she is being honored here today. The community, we all really thank you for everything that you do, Amy. Congratulations. <laughs> Whew, that was an impressive read. I mean, my gosh. To know her is to love her. Okay, um, we do have a few certificates of appreciation that folks can pick, out, pick up on the way out, and I would like to recognize those people now. If you are here, please do stand up and we'll give you a good clap. These certificates of appreciation go to Buckeye Terminal LLC, Chesapeake Terminal, Chesapeake Montessori, and the Rotary Club of Chesapeake. Congratulations to those folks as well. Well. Guys, we did it. We got through it, all of those incredible awards. Thank you, Eric, for that awesome information. Now I feel like I need to go home and work on my yard. Um, thank you to everyone who supports the Chesapeake Environmental Improvement Council throughout the years, all of our elected officials um, and city staff who are so involved in all that we try and do around this community. And we want everyone to be on the lookout for cool projects and incredible people who are doing good things in Chesapeake and make sure to nominate them for these awards next year. So we will see you then. Thank you, everyone.